Okay, so thank you for, for those who I've not seen uh, who've attend, uh, come along. Um, it always upsets me sometimes when they come, you know, we don't get vast crowds of people. You know, I just think the, these talks are so important and I wish more people would come. <laughs> um, <coughs> Established uh, professor in um, environmental law, been studying the subject for uh, a long time. Has a mastery over the the, the issues and <laughs> <laughs> uh, from originally from South Africa, but now uh, he's in the uh, University of Warwick, and um, he's a leading scholar in environmental law, international environmental law, but also climate justice issues. issues and, the interrelationship between environmental law and human rights. And <clears throat> he's tackling today a subject that, for some people, they think that this is a peripheral issue, but it's really on the horizon and is being put forward by many as a solution to climate change, and a real solution to, so that we don't go above 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, uh, and we meet the Paris Agreement targets. But the implications of it are phenomenal and uh, really need to be understood uh, within a legal framework. So Sam's going to talk about that, and, uh, and he's got some large words up there. Um, <laughs> it's got a word chemistry, which frightens me. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so yeah, hands to Sam, and he'll be doing a talk for 45 minutes, or so, and then we'll have a Q&A afterwards. Okay. Thanks, Claire. So thanks, thanks for the invitation, and thanks to you for being here. Um, Fair is correct. This is uh, an important issue and it's going to become increasingly important. Um, uh, an issue that we are going to have to address. Uh, and as you'll see, the, the arguments here are we need collective action. And the question is how we do that in transparent, accountable, and democratic ways. Um, and uh, my work in this area is very much in a spirit of inquiry. It's, uh, how do we do this? We need to start having discussions amongst ourselves and then hopefully getting this into um, broader public discourse. Actually, it's um, this presentation is based on a, an article with the title of, of the seminar that came out in the Journal of Human Rights and the Environment 8.1. Um, if anybody wants to look at this in, in greater detail. Um, I apologize in advance to people who may know quite a lot about geoengineering, but I can't assume that everybody does. So if you'll bear with me as I go through um, just outlining what the issues are. So to summarize, in a sense, is Fair was talking about you know, the aim in Article 2 of the Paris Agreement to keep glo average global temperature from increasing by no more than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, and preferably the exhortation to prevent um, t temperature from rising by more than 1.5 degrees, which is what small island developing states threatened with inundation from rising sea levels actually need to survive. It's an existential question. So uh, during the Paris negotiations, for example, they had a campaign, uh, 1.5, to survive. Uh, and so the temperature is, would we trust anybody to have their finger on the global thermostat? Should anybody? Um, because as, as I go through this, we, the questions uh, that will arise is whether we should permit geoengineering, 
Uh, and if so, is it possible to regulate it? How relevant is the law? How useful is the law in relation to an issue like geoengineering? So, I'll start with the volcanoes. Um, in 1991, as you see, Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines erupted. And global average, global temperature was reduced by half a degree Celsius for a time. Now, since the Industrial Revolution, temperatures have increased by about 1.1 degrees Celsius. So we're already very, very close to the 1.5 degree uh, target in Article 2, and halfway towards breaching the 2 degree Celsius target. And the volcanoes are relevant because what scientists are attempting to do with one strand of geoengineering is to mimic what volcanoes do. And you can see there that David Keith is the well-known Harvard scientist who uh, is presiding over this project. You'll see this was March 2017, a $20 million project to send aerosol injections up into the stratosphere uh, in the biggest chemtrails experiment to date. Now, what we know from previous volcanic eruptions is that in addition to decreasing temperature by putting this kind of uh, duvet effect, preventing uh, the, the heat um, from reaching the surface of the planet, they also have decreased rainfall precipitation in many parts of the world. And this is relevant because if the geoengineering takes place and reduces the precipitation, if, for example, it disrupts the monsoon in South Asia, we're talking about one and a half billion people's food and water security being threatened. So it's potentially very, very serious indeed. And <coughs> the solar radiation management, which I'll come to in a moment, uh, works by spraying sulfates into the atmosphere. And we also know that sulfur dioxide depletes the ozone layer. So there's another potential problem that arises. Now, there are two main types of geoengineering. The one first one, carbon dioxide removal, is relatively benign. And I'll go through the pros and cons of both of these two main types. Uh, the problematic one is solar radiation management. Now, with carbon dioxide removal or carbon sequestration, it's, you probably know it, you've probably heard of carbon capture and storage, which is, as you see, a technique for the long-term storage of carbon dioxide. So we might find the disused oil wells in the North Sea to be a good place to store the carbon dioxide or in some kind of climate, climate or poetic justice, the coal mines, the pits that have been closed, the coal being the dirtiest of the three uh, fossil fuels, uh, they might be good places to store carbon dioxide uh, in future. And now this takes place, carbon sequestration takes place in plants and the soil as a natural process. Um, and of course, the most important carbon sinks are the tropical forests, which we absolutely have to protect for human survival because of the absorption of carbon dioxide. There is also carbon sequestration underground yeah, in, in the geology, in the Earth's geology. It happens deep in the ocean. And this is where the research in carbon capture and storage is going as a solid material. Now, the idea, for example, is to capture the carbon dioxide as it's emitted in industrial processes. 
turn it into a solid and bury it. So with terrestrial carbon sequestration, the carbon dioxide is absorbed naturally through photosynthesis and stored as carbon in biomass and soil. Now, in relation to forests, tropical deforestation is responsible for 20% of annual global carbon dioxide emissions. And an area the size of Wales is disappearing from the Amazon every year. Um, and under Lula and then Dilma Rousseff's governments in Brazil, there was some progress being made that's now going into quite a big reverse. There are massive problems with the annual burning off of uh, crops and cutting down of forests in uh, Indonesia, in Asia. Um, and it's imperative that... Um, we try to preserve them. There is the uh, Red Plus framework for reducing uh, forest degradation and deforestation that perhaps we could chat about um, after I finish speaking um, and whether that is likely to succeed um, because it basically involves commodifying forests. Um, we're sadly at the point where uh, the solution to um, climate change seems to be to turn nature into a range of commodities because uh, in a neoliberal world, uh, we don't seem to have conversations that don't involve price, um, or not many. With the geological sequestration, you get the storing of carbon dioxide underground in rock formations over a long period of time. And the carbon dioxide is held in small pore spaces that have held oil and natural gas for millions of years. Now, here yeah, this with sort of like laugh I nearly cried a bit. Uh, some of the ideas that have been put forward for um, the geoengineering technologies. So you'll see, for example, climate-ready crops, artificial trees. And I really, really do not understand why when trees are so efficient at absorbing carbon dioxide, we would want to invent artificial trees. Uh, biochar, burning and then burying uh, agricultural carbon waste underground. There's things like enhanced weathering, uh, where, uh, because the carbon dioxide gets absorbed in the rocks geologically and you can enhance that process. But there are things there you see, like white painting, so, presumably, we're going to have to paint every roof in the world white to reflect as much sunshine as possible, which is obviously much more sensible than reducing the use of fossil fuels. Space mirrors. Firing trillions of tiny aluminium mirrors into space to deflect sunlight. Do you think... When the people sat down in a room and came up with this, this idea, what were they actually smoking? Because what would be the carbon footprint of sending millions of mirrors into space? Um, cloud seeding. Um, again, if we could spray seawater into clouds to precipitate rain, fine. But two of the areas of climate science that are least understood uh, to date, uh, relatively less understood, are ocean warming and cloud formation. So there's uncertainty, as is there, there is intrinsic uncertainty in 
all climate science, but those are two areas. Certainly cloud formation is, is a potential problem. So here are some of the other, as I say, brave, brilliant, bizarre, benign, or just bonkers. Uh, Rap Greenland, it, it, these are serious. I'm not making this stuff up. These, these are serious things. Um, Greenland is the largest island in the world. So wrapping it in a blanket sounds wildly impractical, but that is exactly what Dr. Jason Fox, a glaciologist from Ohio State University, proposes to do. He believes that if the world covers the country's glaciers with blankets, this will be enough to reflect the sun's rays and prevent the ice caps from melting. Uh, about two years ago, NASA and Bill Gates teamed up to hatch plans for a seawater spraying machine that could prevent climate change by creating clouds that reflect sunlight away from Earth. The machines could suck up 10 tons of water per second and then spray it over 3,000 feet into the air, increasing the density of clouds. Although the plan would help to mitigate climate change, it would take a large amount of energy to power each individual ship. And the study showed that it would take at least 1,900 ships at a cost of over $7 billion to stop the Earth's temperature from rising. And the list wouldn't be complete as the one I've referred to before, giving the Earth a solar shield. This is the idea of someone called Roger Angel. And according to his plan, there would be the constructive of a massive 100,000 square mile solar shield made from trillions of lenses. This would help to deflect the sun's rays by 2% and keep the Earth cooler. The catch is, that since it takes years, or did, to plan a shuttle mission, this project is practically impossible. And it would cost, the estimate when people sort of ran the figures, $350 trillion. 12 times global uh, economic output annual. And of course, its carbon footprint would be insane. So. In relation to carbon dioxide removal, uh, the pros are, and this is an important one, it's relatively safe. Okay? The, the risks of capturing and storing carbon dioxide appear to be relatively low. And it is relatively cheaper than solar radiation management techniques, which I'll come to in a moment. The cons are that it's unproven, underdeveloped, and it will take many, many years to deploy at scale. This would have to be rolled, first of all, it would have to be proved to be effective, and then rolled out across the world. Uh, and from my research into this, we don't have the time that it would take. We're running out of time to uh, meet the two degrees. I don't think there's any chance of not reaching the 1.5 degree Celsius uh, goal in the Paris Agreement. We're running out of time with two degrees. Uh, and I can't see that carbon capture and storage at its current state of development would work uh, in sufficient time. So here are some of the basic ideas of uh, involved in carbon capture and storage. With the conventional one, the fossil fuel goes into the factory and comes out as carbon dioxide. With uh, carbon capture and storage, a majority of the carbon dioxide is stored, and so you get a reduction in emissions. With biomass energy, you get a closed cycle where the, the biomass goes into the industrial process comes out as carbon dioxide, which is then reabsorbed by uh, the trees. 
and then the final one where you do have th this this one would give you zero emissions with um, BEX with uh, biomass energy with carbon capture and storage you would have negative emissions so it would actually be reducing the amount of emissions and again um, so that would be um, very virtuous if it can be done. So at the risk of <coughs> some kind of repetition, um, the idea of artificial trees, also the idea of fertilizing the ocean, um, of, and uh, this has happened, it's illegal. Um, as far as I'm aware, but a Canadian called Russ George, I think, tried to do something of this kind um, in about 2010 or somewhere around there until he was stopped by the Canadian government. Um, there are other ideas um, to try and uh, get more algae to bloom in the ocean because algae will suck up carbon dioxide. Um, and, of course, the idea of, of chimney filters that I've mentioned before. So that's, as I say, relatively, uh, relatively safe and relatively uh, cheap are the, are the virtues of carbon dioxide removal. The problem area is solar radiation management. So albedo modification is cloud modification, as I say, using the Pinotube effect of mimicking, mimicking volcanoes. And you can see from the diagram there that you have in the injection of aerosols into the upper atmosphere to increase the scattering of sunlight, causing less sunlight to reach the surface. And secondly, increasing the reflectivity of low clouds to cool the planet. So is it feasible? Can it be done? Um, the problems at the outset are uh, that, well, depending on which scheme is being proposed, it may or may not be less costly than carbon dioxide removal. It is definitely more risky, and I'll go through some of the risks. The big issue here, um, well, well, there are two issues from a legal and a political and a democratic perspective. The first is research. The second is deployment. And decisions have to be made. Well, the research is going ahead. Should we, could we, would we want to ban research into solar radiation management techniques that are thought to be risky? Could, could we possibly do it? I was just having a conversation earlier on about, for example, yesterday, the news that um, two macaques have been cloned in China. And so we know that because the scientists doing the, the, the work are revealing what they're doing. But we can't be sure about what research is being done in which institutions in which countries. So even if we wanted to ban research, would it be possible using the law? Would, isn't it better to try and get as much transparency as possible so at least we know who's trying to do what? So the research is, is one thing we can come back and talk about it. The second is deployment. Now, the problem with solar radiation management is that if it's done at a scale that is necessary to find out whether it will work, and it has unintended consequences, it creates risks, would we be able to recall it? And if we couldn't, what should we do? Should we ban deployment? 
could we then deploy them? So a lot of the research is being done through modeling um, because of the problems inherent in deploying at scale. Now, some of the consequences of injecting sulfates into the stratosphere is, are that we might have permanent clouds. I say to my students, would you like your children to grow up? The sky might turn orange. The sky wouldn't be blue. We'd have next generations growing up without knowing blue skies. So, you know, when I talk about, you know, the price of everything and the value of nothing, what price do we put, or what value should we put on blue skies for saving polar bears? Or any of the kinds of, you know, on, on forests as, as, um, for their intrinsic value rather than their economic value. Um, we'd have to have, according to some of the... Uh, Research, as I said, uh, a permanent flotilla of ships up to 2,000, or a fleet of balloons uh, permanently uh, above the earth that were spraying the sulfate. The big problem is, potentially, if we start, we might not be able to stop. So... <coughs> Let's assume that one or more of these technologies works. If we start spraying sulfates into the atmosphere, and it does work, and it reduces the temperature, we would have to keep doing it forever. Because if we stopped doing it, the temperature would just spiral completely out of control. And again, we're not sure, in terms of climate science, already, whether we're at or past tipping points, negative feedback loops, because again, we've never been here before. We never have, have human beings conducted an experiment like climate change on the planet. So we'd have no way of measuring what we're doing now against something before, because we've never been here before. So, if suddenly it stopped being done, the temperature might go up like four, five, six degrees Celsius. So it would have to be permanent. And as I said, some of the uh, side effects, potential side effects, would be affecting precipitation such as the South Asian monsoon. We're already seeing massive, massive forest fires. So, in California, in the, in the Napa Valley, in the wine country in California, huge, huge forest fires on a regular basis. There is, um, I was saying to Faye, there is a, a group of Portuguese youths who are crowdfunding uh, climate litigation against the Portuguese government for failing to... Um, put into place policies that are preventing the annual savage forest fires in Portugal. So these, this is already happening. This is, these are manifestations of what's already happening. It could get worse. If the precipitation uh, is undermined, it could intensify the droughts. Now again, we were just talking about I don't know if you know what's happening in Cape Town. Now, Cape Town is running out of water. It's, the, it's the, that area of South Africa is experiencing uh, the biggest drought since records began. And by April the 12th, they're going to be standpipes. And it's not, not going to stop. There's a drought been going on for two years now. There's desertification that's creep. Desertification is taking place in sub Saharan Africa as the Sahara uh, creeps southwards. It's taking place in the southwest of the United States. Arizona, New Mexico, parts of California are turning into desert. In Australia, 
And so the, the danger is we can see what's happening already with one point, about 1.1 degrees Celsius increase in temperature. Um, these are some of the potential risks of solar radiation management that could intensify these risks. So, you can see here some of the uh, pros and cons. With carbon dioxide removal, it actually addresses the cause. The cause of the climate change is primarily carbon dioxide. There are several other greenhouse gases. But so we're trying to deal with carbon dioxide. Whereas with uh, the solar radiation management, it doesn't address the problem. It's trying to mitigate the problem without necessarily reducing the use of or the emission of carbon dioxide. In fact, one of the big risks of geoengineering is that people look at it and say, well, we've got a, a get out of jail card. We can carry on merrily using fossil fuels as much as we want. So uh, we can go and as far as the Russians and others around the Arctic are concerned, there is this virtuous circle where uh, climate change leads to the melting of the Arctic ice which makes it possible to get the oil and gas that's under uh, the Arctic and burn it, intensifying the problem. So there, people are advocating, certainly you know, uh, the, the fossil fuel companies, um, geoengineering to enable them to continue profiting from the extraction of fossil fuels. Um, things are changing because now New York has threatened to uh, uh, a case against fossil fuel companies. There is a case being brought in California. A couple of municipalities in California are bringing a case against uh, energy companies for rising sea levels on the California coast. So gradually um, there is... a. a Extended amount that climate litigation is now taking off in quite a big way. And James Hansen, the NASA scientist who sort of first alerted the US government in about 1987 to the true scale of what was going on, has now called for a massive uh, wave of climate litigation um, because he thinks, with a great deal of justification, sad to say, that the Paris Agreement, well, his term is bullshit. Um, he just thinks it's, n it's not got enough teeth. It may be legally binding, but it's not enforceable, as we can see with the Trump administration threatening to pull out. And with the climate litigation, there are t it seems to me there are two um, main forms. One is against states, such as uh, against the Portuguese government for the forest fires, etc. The other now, increasingly, there are attempts to do to the energy companies what uh, happened with the tobacco companies. Again, it took a long, long time to deal with the tobacco companies. And, uh, in many cases, they've just shifted now to the global south where the rules on smoking, etc., are, are not as strong uh, as they are elsewhere. Uh, and we're running out of time there again. So. To go back here, so the carbon dioxide proposals, there are no great new global risks, whereas with SRM, there certainly are. The carbon dioxide removal are expensive, or are currently expensive, or expensive comparable to the cost of emissions reduction, whereas the SRM techniques are said to be relatively inexpensive. Carbon dioxide removal may produce only modest effects uh, within decades, whereas solar radiation management can produce quite substantial effects if the technologies work within a much shorter time. 
So far as law and politics are concerned, carbon dioxide removal raises fewer and less difficult issues with global governance. Uh, in stark contrast to um, solar radiation management. Carbon dioxide removal would be judged largely on, on cost, whereas solar radiation management will be, needs to be addressed in terms of risk. So those are, without going through all of them, those are some of the uh, comparisons that are salient. So what are the ethical issues involved here? Well, there's the moral hazard, as I said. Will climate engineering reduce incentives to mitigate? So people say we don't have to worry about re uh, re keeping temperature from increasing by more than two degrees Celsius because we've got a technology. And it's kind of, there's a kind of technology fetishism op uh, operating here where, um, you know, it's uh, the boys with toys. And a lot of it is actually... Um, it's very male-dominated. There's a kind of male geo-clique pretty much in Europe and North America um, who are making these proposals. Um, many of them, I, I referred to the Harvard experiment earlier on, um, many of them have got patents on the technology. So they're hoping to get very rich uh, by saving the world. Uh, is solar radiation management a slippery slope? Is the research and insurance policy to come back to the question of whether we should allow it or not? Given where we are, and given the intensifying climate harms that we see all around us uh, you know, on a daily basis now, it's not as though... You know, it used to be said climate change was a kind of invisible problem. It's not invisible. If, if you can't see climate change, it's because you're not looking. It's not, you know, watching the news or reading newspapers or whatever it is. So would it be a dereliction of duty or a violation of moral obligations not to undertake the research? Shouldn't we have an insurance policy in our back pocket? But that then creates the problem that Einstein foresaw with uh, nuclear weapons. If you make them, someone will use them. And we see, again, um, it's a toss-up. Again, you were saying the doomsday clock has now been shifted to two minutes to midnight for two reasons. The threat of nuclear war with uh, Kim Jong-un and uh, that bastard in the White House, and climate change. Uh, so if the research has taken place, was the fact that it's taken place kind of force our uh, c collective head? And uh, every time I, I do this, I put the hour in inverted commas because a good friend, Anna Greer, who's actually the editor of the Journal of Human Rights and the Environment, insists all the time that when we're talking about the we, who is the we who are, is responsible for climate change? And again, historically, it's been Western white men who historically, since the Industrial Revolution, have been responsible for most of the greenhouse gas emissions. The, you know, the people in the global south have been responsible for very few. So who is the we when people talk about the Anthropocene so that we have become a telluric agent? We have, are now capable. We have changed the geology of the planet um, through things like plastics, concrete, radionuclides, traces of that uh, in the geology, and, of course, uh, the effects of climate change. But who is the we who is responsible for having done that. And of course, who should decide? So, could we be confident that someone like Trump wouldn't authorize an experiment? Because America first is the withdrawal of multilateralism, the destruction for all its many problems of the liberal international order. Um, you can foresee a situation saying, hey, 
the southwest of the United States is turning into a desert. We need to do something. Mexico wouldn't have a say. Nobody, potentially, anybody else might have a say. And so to going back to that question of whose hand, if anybody, uh, should be on the global thermostat. To what extent will human rights be undermined? Um, will climate engineering further undermine human rights? Because we're talking about um, a very wide range of human rights that are already threatened. Um, livelihoods, uh, food security, water security, um, the right to life itself. I mean, people are dying in the Caribbean and elsewhere from climate change. Climate change is, is, is violating human rights. And so the, my perspective on this is to say, should we risk finding out? And the other side of it is, can we risk not finding out? Now, um, I'm still sort of hoping against hope that we can do this through mitigation. But I think the pressures are going to increase quite substantially to permit geoengineering. Now, there was a project that took place in this country in May 2012 called the SPICE Project. The experiment would have injected 150 litres of water into the atmosphere from a weather balloon via a one-kilometre pipe tethered to a ship as part of the stratospheric particle injection for climate engineering, SPICE. Now, this would have been small, relatively low risk, and certainly nowhere near, that's the point I made before, nowhere near the scale where uh, it, it would be an un unacceptable level of risk. Um, the two scientists involved in the project had not been initially forthcoming uh, about the fact that they had submitted patents for the technology similar to that which they wanted to use in the SPICE project. And when the news came out in the media, there was a public outcry and they withdrew it. And what's interesting about that is that there was this kind of immediate and quite substantial public reaction saying, no, we don't like this. It's like, you know, debates about genetically modified crops, etc., those kind of things about all the things, you know, that we're going to have such fun with when we get this massive trade deal with the United States and get chlorinated chicken and, and beef hormones and all the stuff that the European Union, the terrible place that the European Union, has resisted in sort of environmental and, and risk and health terms. But it was, as I say, if, if the SPICE project was anything to go by, there was a great deal of unhappiness. Whether that will continue as the impacts of climate change unfold further, we will have to wait and see. This is, um, and it was American businessman, sorry, Russ George, dumped 100 tons of iron sulfate into the Pacific as part of a scheme off the west coast of Canada. And this is where the law comes in. This violates the Convention on Biodiversity and the London Convention on the Dumping of Wastes at Sea, which place moratoria on profit-seeking ocean fertilization activities. Okay, so this, these are quite specific in relation to uh, the oceans. They don't govern the atmosphere. There is no international law uh, on experimenting with the atmosphere in this way. Now, the international environmental law principles that do exist, such as the no-harm principle, the one of the main problems with, the, with international environmental law is that it's very soft law. 
So one would think that a principle like the no-harm principle that should prevent, you know, uh, harming the environment of other countries would apply. Whether the precautionary principle, I mean, you would think that this is the most perfect uh, area for the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle basically says that uh, if there is a risk that a certain uh, activity will cause harm, that the onus is on the person or group of people who want to engage in that activity to show that it is safe. So, again, you would think, perfect, could we use it? Well, I don't know. The, that, just to, to go back to the precautionary principle, if an action or policy has a suspected risk of causing harm to the public or the environment, in the absence of scientific consensus that the action or policy is not harmful, the burden of proof that it is not harmful falls on those taking the action. Now, NMOD is the Environmental Modification Convention, formerly the Convention on the Prohibition of Military or any other hostile use of environmental modification techniques. It's a treaty that prohibits military or other hostile use of environmental modification techniques having widespread, long-lasting, or severe effects. But of course, the proponents of geoengineering are going to argue that this is not hostile or for military use. So in terms of governance, assuming, as I do, that we require governance of geoengineering. What's the best level to do it? Where could it, should it be done? Uh, should it be done at a national level? Should individual countries take steps to regulate these techniques? And part of the problem with trying to regulate them is, would you, I started out by saying there are two kinds, but within, you saw, within solar radiation management, there are a whole range of technologies. Would a piece of legislation be able to encompass all those technologies or would you have to regulate all of them separately? Should it be done at regional levels, for example, through the EU or international? Should there be a dedicated treaty or could this, should this be done under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change? Um, I mentioned the Aarhus Convention, which is a convention on procedural uh, justice. Uh, in environmental issues in which <coughs> countries are required to provide adequate consultation and participation for the public on environmental issues. The, perhaps the most well-known attempt to um, address this are the so-called Oxford Principles. There are five of them. Uh, they looked at governance, they looked at regulation, and came up with these five. First of all, it should be regulated as a public good, as, as something that affects the public. Uh, it's not a private thing, it's a public. There must be public participation in decision making. There must be disclosure of research and open publication of results, because that's what we rely on with biotechnology, with all kinds of science, we rely on the scientific community to do this. There must be independent assessment of the impacts. And finally, there should be governance before deployment. Now, when this came up uh, in the House of Commons, there was a parliamentary subcommittee, I think, who decided that Britain should not outlaw research on geoengineering because the UK can't know what other countries are doing and it might put the country at a disadvantage. There's the danger, despite what they will say that this is not hostile, there is a danger of weaponizing the climate. Um, and because the potential risks can't be contained within borders. We're talking about threats to other countries. 
we're already seeing the massive securitization of climate change. It's now coming way up the agenda. All the spooks, the CIAs and the GCHQs and all the risk assessments, climate change now is a massive security. It's being treated as a security risk. Um, the, if deployment takes place that can't be recalled and, and has uh, unintended effects, it could lead to massive uh, migration uh, that's making what's happening in the Mediterranean now. All the predictions of climate change, we're talking about predictions ranging from like 50 million to 200 million people, and that's going to lead to conflict. Already, um, climate change was an issue at the start of the Syrian war, it was an issue in Darfur, um, and potentially uh, this will get worse. So, we can engineer the climate, well, we think we can, we can certainly do it uh, in terms of carbon capture and storage. But as I say, should we? And who are the we? Uh, so we're having people looking to technology to help us out of the mess that technology has gotten us into. Now, you know, um, there's potentially a lot of hubris uh, involved here. Um, and by people who are promoting what's basically a fast impact um, with geoengineering. And finally, Wouldn't it be more sensible to use the... I'm not opposed to technology per se. We have technologies. Um, this brings us back to uh, you know, policies here about onshore wind, about the subsidies of North Sea oil, but not of solar uh, and renewable energies in this country. Uh, there is an intergenerational aspect here about what kind of planet we leave to future generations. If, as I say, we start and we can't turn the technologies off, they're going to have to live with it. And so we know what to do. Let's reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We know it can be done. The technology, we can, we know that we can decarbonize the global economy by the middle of the century with the technologies we have now. Ren the cost of renewables is already far lower than coal, for example, uh, ar around the world. Um, so, why isn't it happening? And perhaps the question here is, if the law is limited, if regulating is difficult, does it come down to a matter of politics? Is this about political will? And what will it take to change the politics? What has to happen for countries to do what's necessary? Um, the Paris Agreement is a step in the right direction, but, you know, George Monbiot said, I think, uh, a, a very good line about the Paris Agreement. Compared to what it could have been, it's a miracle. Compared to what it should have been, it's a catastrophe. So, is the response to the catastrophe geoengineering? And that's why I said at the outset, I'm really trying to sort of stimulate debate. Um, in addition to Faye, at least one other person I know read the article from which this comes, because I've been invited to talk about this at the uh, Edinburgh Science Festival in April, which is good because it needs to get sort of out of the academy uh, and into public discourse because we have to have a participatory democratic discussion about what we should do. So, thanks for listening through that trip through geoengineering. <coughs> Thank you.
have any questions. I, I, you haven't been listening. <laughs> <laughs> so I would encourage you to please ask uh, Sam some questions. Um, I know I have some, so I will be polite and wait. It sort of strikes me that um, the only way around this is uh, to get public opinion on site. Yeah. And, and I think the, the whole social fabric has changed. Um, people are, um, with modern technology, they have a much shorter attention span and they're much less interested in the sort of scientific background and all the detail mm -hmm. and more in the if you like, the, the snapshots and yeah. the headlines. And I, I think what we saw recently with uh, David Attenborough's film on yeah. plastics, yeah. that you know that short, very, very graphic image mm -hmm. had such a huge public reaction. It's almost as though you need David Attenborough to make a, a, a documentary on the atmosphere and how things are changing yeah. and that sort of thing. Yeah. And then public opinion will gradually yeah. take over. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I, I think that the, the value of that is that we need climate change. We need to approach climate change from every single possible way. We need stories. We need art, music, literature. Um, the, the academic stuff and the law is, 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 is insufficient. And the, the Attenborough example is that person trusted to that extent with that image uh, has a potentially massive effect. I don't know where and how we could tell the same story about um, solar radiation management, uh, particularly given the fact that um, <coughs> carbon capture and storage is regarded as positive. So you have a good form of climate engineering and a bad form, and will the two get conflated in you know, the public mind? Uh, and to what end? We have the other issue, which is becoming salient now. And I, at least I, I'm reading in newspapers the division between the, what we might call the less educated classes and the more educated classes. And it doesn't appear to be coming any less noticeable. And with the prime example of President Trump, and there's no no reason to believe that the Trump phenomenon, this phenomenon, won't exist post-Trump. Yeah. And I'm not. Sure, and we've had Mr. Mr. Go for whatever reason yeah. talking yeah. about experts. Yeah. But there are a number of people who, for whatever reason, don't feel that they want to take part in the or, or led by the educated yeah. people. And I'm not sure how this can be solved. I agree. It's it's uh, uh, well. Maybe when Brexit kicks in, there will be the revenge of the experts when uh, the, the the true scale of of the disaster. I have this nightmare that the damn thing works. Yeah, you know, I, I, the same thing about America at the moment and stuff like that. That you know, if the American economy just like keeps growing through the next three years there's a really good chance he'll get elected, uh, get re-elected. And it's kind of nightmarish. We always have the law of unintended consequences. And actually, there's a causality doesn't go in a straight line. The fact that there's more jobs in the US isn't necessarily down to Trump, in a sense. Yeah. The groundwork was laid before the you know, with things that had happened before. And then we also have the cyclical things that, yeah. you know, happen anyway. I think as regards uh, climate change, I think that there is a role for, for us, um, in, who understand the science, in terms of actually pushing more the things that we can do with, from a baseline. I think one of the things that bothers me is not enough is being done to actually get people on side in terms of the things they can do here and now, like you know, using solar power and so yeah. on. Yeah. It's still sort of, well, up in yeah. the ether somewhere. Yeah. Um, and I think that you almost have to 
live with, yeah. to some extent, the negative things that are happening, uh, the trumps of this world that are happening, and actually recognize that that is a season, and there is stuff that you have to get on and do. And I personally see, if, if anybody goes to a place um, on an annual thing like I do to the Caribbean, a um, couple of times a year, um, to the Caribbean, you can see it, it's there. Yeah. You, 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 yeah. you know, um, and people have done stuff, yeah. but even so, it's not enough. Yeah. Um, things like hurricanes yeah. are getting far more frequent yeah. and far more vicious, um, and you can see where development yeah. is being turned yeah. back um, by a long, long way. And so I think the time for people, people have got to, for me, we have got to work in spite of the trumps of this world yeah. and so yeah. on, and, and you know, drop pebbles and pools wherever we are. And I think I, I am, because this is about the global thing, I'm really quite interested in where um, the legal things uh, can be used, because w what we're seeing is that we talk about the patents, yeah. but it's not only the patents, they're people, um, for example, I was in New Zealand uh, last spring, and one of the things that's very obvious there, there are people in the States who are deniers of climate change, but at the same time, they're buying up huge swathes of New Zealand because they think that they're being, they will be protected in New Zealand. Sur survivalists, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. you know, and, and they, yeah. they're buying up um, yeah. Yeah. huge swathes yeah. of New Zealand yeah. um, and, and causing really real disruption yeah. um, to all yeah. sorts of yeah. aspects of yeah. New Zealand. And so where this is the sort of uh, thing for me, um, trying to use community activism and the law yeah. where we can yeah. as a disruptive force yeah. to do this. Yeah. Um, obviously backed up by the science as we yeah. know it and, and, and there's a the role. Uh, yeah. I, I wish we could get more people in here and yeah. particularly politicians. Well, uh, you see the, the dilemma we have is that uh, states are absolutely central to this and states are a, a problem. So I remember one of the conference of the parties, I can't remember exactly, I think it was Durban, I can't remember which number that was, about two, three years before Paris, and a young woman got up and she said to them, I'm 17 years old or something, you've been negotiating about this since before I was born. And yeah, you know, that. so if, if the Paris Agreement had come 20 years ago, we would have maybe a better than even chance. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, states have been very, very bad in dealing with the issue, but they're indispensable because the actions of individual people are meaningful only in terms of state action. So, for example, we saw, like, the massive change as soon as the 5P charge came in for plastic bags. And you know behavioural change and stuff like that. But this is where the law, this is where the regulation and stuff like that. So now actually stopping to sell plastic bags entirely uh, in the supermarkets because I think Tesco are now saying okay, they're not going to stock plastic bags, but they will pr they will provide reusable bags for 15p. So and but that requires some kind of domestic or international action, and then. The actions of if, if, if there are public transport options, if there are cycle paths, if there are all those kind of things that require governance and government at local, right up to international level, then individual actions can make a difference. Um, and the other thing in response to what you were saying about, I think the only way we have a chance with this is through activism. The only possible way is from the bottom up, because from the top down it hasn't worked. And thankfully, I mean, most uh, young people now are much more switched onto this um, issue uh, th than previous generations. And hopefully, I mean, again, you know, in relation to uh, what's happening in the United States, um, in cities and the individual states, there are activities now going on that m probably mean that the U.S. will meet 
the commitments Obama made in the Paris Agreement by bypassing the Trump administration. And that's because it's happening on the ground. So I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, the, activism is the key to all of this. That's, that's, when I raise the question about political will, that's how political will, will change, hopefully. So I had a point about um, international environmental law that mm -hmm. you mentioned. Um, and as you mentioned, obviously a lot of the principles are some sort of soft law, but I, I, I know there has been some literature on the no-harm rule and mm -hmm. climate and ge geoengineering. Yeah. Um, do you see it facing this in terms of if there is ever litigation between two states or something like that, do you see it facing the same issue? Do you see ever, as, as climate change litigation has, or is geoengineering slightly easier to um, implement these rules, such as the no-harm rule? Um, well, for states, to, I mean, the only place that states could uh, litigate against each other would be in the International Court of Justice, yeah. and that, which requires the states to submit to the court's jurisdiction. And a, a state who's supporting or facilitating geoengineering is very unlikely to submit to the jurisdiction of the court. And the, the, the court is actually, there are debates, um, which I actually need to read a, a little bit more on, about the pros and cons. Um, there are, I think it's the Marshall Islands have been calling for an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on climate change, akin to the nuclear weapons uh, case, etc. And there are some people who think that uh, this may rebound. It may not be the most positive thing to do um, it would require a General Assembly resolution. And I think, I think it's Palau and Marshall Islands. Um, do, do you know more about it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, do you know what the state of play is in relation to that? No. Yeah. I just know that it's not in the My understanding is that, that what they're doing, trying to do is push for a definitive figure. You know, rather than a judgment, they want a definitive figure regarding temperature rise. Okay. And beyond that, yeah. it's kind of a bit illegal, uh -huh. illegal, you know. Yeah. Well, but we've got the definitive figure in a sense. You know, like that the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is the biggest peer scientific peer review exercise in history. You know, with 97% consensus. We, that, that's the frustrating thing. The science is absolutely clear. You know, uh, what's less clear is what the implications are of, of every small incremental increase in temperature, because we've never been here before. But we know what we have to do. We know we can do it. So uh, I, I'm actually, we were talking earlier on about a, a friend and colleague, uh, Pendra Bakshi. Uh, I'm, I'm actually like co-authoring a book on climate justice with, at, at the moment. Um, and uh, all of these issues about rights, about future generations, about you know, the, the fallout in the Caribbean and stuff like that and elsewhere. So who owes what to whom? Who is historically most responsible for causing the problems? Uh, and so you, what does the global north Oh, to the poor and vulnerable in the, in the global south, who are least responsible. But it's also, uh, again, we're talking about lifeboats for the, for the rich. It's, it's, it's uh, an issue even within uh, developed countries. Katrina, Houston, Puerto Rico. Um, you know, and, and of, of course, in a place like the United States, it's racialized, because everything is racialized in the United States, because the vulnerable tend to be live in areas that are most vulnerable to the impacts of the, uh, the, the, the storms, etc. So, um, uh, I, I, I was saying to Faye earlier, I, I strive to, um, every time I'm preparing I teach two modules on climate change. 
Uh, every time I sort of want to slit my throat when I started no, no, to prepare. No, 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 and no, and no. I said to say, you cannot go into a class uh, and, you know, have students come out of a class thinking there's no hope. But there, there, there actually is hope. There, there are things happening now in terms of um, divestment. So New York now divesting from fossil fuels, etc. That's massive. That's really, really big. So that's the good side, you know, what I was talking about, the cities and the states. And then I, I watch... They might invest in geoengineering. Well, <laughs> so, so we have New York doing that. We have the divestment campaign is the biggest and most successful divestment campaign since the, a, a, apartheid. And now Aramco are being floated, probably on the London Stock Exchange, and the biggest flotation in history. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking... You know, the Saudi oil company? Yes. Trillions um, for a fossil fuel company. Uh, and, and the irony of it is, uh, I suppose, that Saudi Arabia um, is trying to diversify its economy away yes, from, away yes, from oil. Yes, um, yes. And again, you just look everywhere. Um, that part of the world, uh, in terms of w what's going to happen, that already temperatures are almost unbearable. Yeah. It's going to get to the point in the Gulf where human beings can't function because the body shuts down. If you can't sweat, if you can't cool yourself down. So construction will be impossible. We've already got this ludicrous crooked World Cup taking place in Qatar with all the migrant workers from South Asia dying, you know, because of the, the conditions they're working under and stuff like that. As the temperatures go up, I mean... You know, in India, about 18 months ago, 50 degrees. And this is, you know, there's a no... The other thing is just, um, we have to stop talking about natural disasters. They're not natural. They're anthropogenic. They're caused by human beings. Um, so, you know, the hurricanes aren't natural. Well, yes, to, to an extent they are. But the intensity and the, the frequency is now... Anthropos, um, anthropogenic. So, yeah, we just have to keep on keeping on. I know it sounds trite, but the, the, we have to. We just we we have to. I, if, so far as I'm concerned, it's a kind of division of labour, so that from an academic and intellectual perspective, I can try to to provide ideas that. So, for example the Global Network on Human Rights uh, and the Environment, um, we've now s teamed up with Greenpeace so to try and provide academic input into the climate litigation that, uh, that they're undertaking. We've got a workshop on climate litigation at, at Warwick in, on the 14th of February, in which we're actually looking at, uh, so there again, uh, in terms of positive things sort of happening, where um, uh, there's now... I think we've reached a threshold where there's going to be tons and tons of climate litigation. Um, there's a law firm in London trying to bring, uh, get a judicial review of the government's policies here under the Climate Change Act to places all over South Africa, Pakistan, you name it, and people are now resorting to the law. And there, again, there are real problems with the law because... Um, well, two. One is standing. Who um, has the right to bring a case? South Asia is quite good because of um, public interest litigation where anybody can bring a case. They don't have to have a direct uh, relationship to the harms that are caused. The other is causation. Because in trying to uh, make governments uh, or energy companies responsible since greenhouse gases don't obey, obey borders, how do you prove that the emissions of the United States or the UK were responsible for the harms that are taking place in the Caribbean or somewhere else in, in, in the Pacific? Um, so again, I sort of come back to, we have to use every single lever we've got, but to me, the, the, the political ultimately, you know, and with the litigation, we're going to have to pull every lever as many times until we sort of get 
it comes up jackpot. And if we get one big case against energy companies, that might open the floodgates. But if we just have to keep on doing this again and again and again. So that's why I think there's a division of labor between the NGOs, the environmental NGOs, between students, lawyers, uh, academics, everybody contributing to the extent that it's possible. And, and, and as I said, from every perspective, um, the media, uh, artists, musicians, everybody, the more stories we can tell, because, you know, and the picture speaking a thousand words, coming back to David Attenborough and stuff like that, but also in terms of climate justice, trying to get to a point where um, a lot of the th things with charity is to try and humanise the effect. So in terms of the violation of, of human rights, etc., if we can show how this is affecting human beings, um, the trouble with, with the, uh, the charities is charity fatigue. And, uh, you know, if we start, if we can show how people are losing livelihoods because of climate change, or people are dying, will it spur uh, more action? And we just have to keep on keeping on because I, it, morally we can't not. We, we have to do everything we can um, to try and uh, achieve uh, justice for current and future generations. Um, I've got uh, my son and my daughter-in-law is actually originally from the Caribbean. Um, are seriously talking about whether they want to have children because of a thing like climate change. And that's like, yeah. So, um, thinking about what kind of world their children would grow up in. And that's why I raised the issue about blue skies and, and orange and polar bears and stuff like that. And, and what... Well, speaking as a grandmother, I think they should go ahead. I, 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 I think, um, I, I always say, um, you know, we're survivors in one form or another, and if you think about the history of the Caribbean, you know, we, yeah. we, ha we have a yeah. lot of life left yeah. in this yeah. thing. And, and just one thing that um, is always worth remembering, that actually sometimes we can use existing laws yeah. for, you know, to get, to get to what, where we want to get to. I'm not suggesting mm. it's easy in any way, mm. but I speak as someone who I remember using... Um, the control of substances hazardous to health legislation to deal with the tobacco issue, uh, pollu pollution from tobacco in indoor environments. Yeah. So um, it, it yeah. can be um, interesting yeah. when you use something that was actually yeah. meant about something yeah. else, mm. but actually turned out to be very useful in I mean, another. Well, that's, I mean, in terms of uh, litigation and attribution for climate change. Yes. Uh, asbestos is one. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. you've got m multiple businesses yeah. that some an individual works yeah. for. Mm. You know, you can attribute yeah. reasonably, yeah. you know, a number of a proportion of the yeah. causation yeah. to, and and the science around attribution on climate change is getting really sophisticated. Yeah. Really. It is. Yeah. Uh, and that, and that's obviously yeah. going to feed into the possibility of holding to account uh, business businesses. Yeah. Well, th this is, you know, in, in, in my research and teaching, I'm sort of looking at the potential and the limits of the law. So here is a question in terms of regulation about how effective would law be here? Could we actually do it through law if we wanted to do it? Another one, just in relation to the Caribbean, is in terms of migration. So you're going to have millions of people displaced by climate change, by the impacts of climate change, and who are, most of them will be internally displaced. Um, but, and when the migration happens, it's most likely to be to neighboring states, but they're going to migrate with absolutely no protection under international law. And so you start to say, okay, could we envisage a dedicated treaty, a, a protocol to the 1951 uh, refugee convention under which I came to this country, that purely political test, no climate. Your lawyers are now looking at whether the um, well-founded fear of persecution, whether climate change could constitute a form of persecution. So again, imagine I, I've got the, the three eyes I talk about in terms of lawyers. We need to be innovative, imaginative, and insurgent. We need to try 
every... One of the liberating things about this is that we're almost obliged to sort of go into... To engage in thinking that might be regarded as bizarre bonkers or, or off the wall. But you, you just have to try and think about it. So in terms of migration, for example, um, in, in the current climate, you cannot... I cannot foresee uh, Europe, United States doing a dedicated treaty for the protection of climate displaced people. I can't see a protocol, another protocol to the 1951 Refugee Convention. I can't see a protocol to the Framework Convention, etc. So we, we end up here, we've got this uh, legal loophole or this lacuna where uh, people are going to be moving without protection under the law. So th now we're starting already um, Kiribati, I think it is, has bought land in Fiji. We're getting all sorts of novel problems that start to turn up about whether it's possible uh, f for, to have permanent governments in exile. So as already as the small island states start disappearing, and I'll come back to this, it's relevant to the Caribbean, could they have governments in exile in another country? Which country would that be? Would they have to buy land? Now, so, so part of the arguments are to say that people in the Pacific, the obvious places for them to go would be Australia and New Zealand. Because those are two uh, developed countries who have historically emitted, especially Australia, quite a very bad record on, on, on uh, greenhouse gas emissions and stuff like that. And because there are already diaspora communities there. So you think, okay, that's kind of logical, but you'd have to try and convince a country like Australia, whose immigration policies are horrific. I mean, there are people self-harming and committing suicide in Nauru and, and Fiji and stuff like that. Would they agree to that? What do you do? You know, so you're thinking diaspora communities, things in common. Where do the people from the Maldives go? A predominantly Muslim country. To Sri Lanka, which is Tamil and Sinhalese. To uh, Hindu fundamentalist India. To Bangladesh, which is a, a Muslim country, but is going to be one of the biggest, already one of the biggest sufferers from sea level rise. Now, with the Caribbean, um, the obvious diaspora community is. <laughs> and in terms of climate justice, I saw this figure that um, from something like 1800 to about 2010, two countries were responsible for half of all greenhouse gas emissions, or carbon dioxide, the US and the UK. Two countries responsible for half. So when you talk about historical responsibility, ability to pay the benefits that have, that have been accrued from the use of fossil fuels, the UK qualifies on all of those grounds. There is the, the links, as I said, the diaspora communities, the cultural links between people here and people in the Caribbean. Can you see any future British government because the small island states in the Caribbean are going to be threatened. You know, not all of the islands, not all of the time, but as the sea levels rise and people are forced to, to shift away from the coast, come into conflict, etc. We, we really have to, my fear is, we end up dealing with all of this on an ad hoc, case-by-case -case humanitarian basis, which is what we do with natural disasters. We put out the, the begging bowl to countries, the UN agencies do that all the time. We need to think ahead. We need to do this in a more rational way because we're talking about millions of people. And again, the, the law is just bad here. I mean, I think you, in, when you were listing the reason why the UK and the US should pay people, you say the ability to pay. Now, every Joe on the street, if you said yeah. the UK has the ability yeah. to pay today, yeah. they would go, no, we don't. We can't even run our health service. We can get rid of the overseas development uh, fund. But, you know, uh, that's why we're leaving the EU. Look, so in the mindset of your average yeah. soul, no way do yeah. we have the ability to pay. It. And I think this is where, you know, what's been interesting about your talk to me has been uh, really the international relations dimension, right? Um, so uh, when you talk about who we is yeah. that could control this, uh, you know, <coughs> I would say more the uh, geoengineering in terms of uh, solar radiation yeah. management. Um, you know, it is 
being funded, and as you can imagine, the research is primarily funded by certain groups as well. We've got interest, yep. vested interest. Um, but it's a north-south issue, yep. um, and that has that's racialized. That a lot of people don't care about people. You know, yep. The population boom that yep. that still goes in people's minds, yep. and all of this kind of is within the ways in which people. Um, respond to the imageries as well. Yeah. I mean, the German is left now, but um, you know, David Attenborough has gone on about climate change for many years. Right? The plastics, it's tangible, it's visible, and yeah. the message was through um, a turtle. You know, yeah. and we like you know, people yeah. respond to turtles. Yeah. People don't respond to large numbers of people yeah. being displaced in conflict areas yeah. from different religious groups. Yeah cultures we don't understand, we don't like. I mean, if I don't think we don't engage enough with that from a legal dimension. Yeah. So we're trying to resolve these things in a legal way yeah. without recognizing the sort of political economy and international relations dimension. Yeah. Well, I, I was about to, you're quite right, of course. Um, and I was sitting here thinking that actually another legal thing here is of course the reparations movement yeah. because uh, a lot of the people in the Caribbean could say quite frankly, yeah. um, well, hello there. You know, a lot of the industrial revolution and, and, and in fact, when I go into the cities, I'm also uh, I'm always rec uh, recognizing the marble halls as being um, where those come from and West India docks and so on. So pe people, that is also a dialogue that needs to happen, that people need to understand that there were times actually when there were problems in this country and people went to the rest of the world and as a result, this country benefited. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's something that's very often not really spelled out. And I think there's more of that that needs to happen as well. But I think in, 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 I'm probably much older than most people here, and I, I, I am actually probably a little bit more optimistic. I think one of the problems we have is people have short memories. They forget that actually, um, you know, there have been times, as I said before, when people needed help, and I can think of the wars and so on, when other people came and helped this uh, Europe. And I think that people need to go back to that. I think that they, the youngsters coming up will find solutions. I can, I've, I've seen lots of changes that have happened. And so I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I don't have pink spectacles on. Um, but I'm, 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 I'm cautiously optimistic that we will find ways of having a dialogue yeah. and finding solutions to this one. And as you said, if everybody, wherever you are, if you make, drop the tool, drop this thing in your tool. Well, I don't want to, I think we should bring it to an end. Yeah. But I just, a couple of comments. One, I don't want to criticize the saintly David Attenborough too much, but he was very poor on climate change for a long, long time. He had the opportunity, yeah. and only recently, and in a, quite a gentle way, he's, uh, you know, he could have done this a long time ago. He could have advanced the debate quite a lot. The other thing is about the reparations. I think that it, it's, it, it's an issue I'm, I think, very much in terms of climate justice, we need to talk about reparations. Uh, and Big subject. Well, when Cameron went to Jamaica, uh, what, about 2014 or something. At the time, there were calls in Jamaica for reparations for colonialism. Mm -hmm. And he, what he gave Jamaica was a prison. <laughs> the British government offered, in terms of aid, to build a prison. And I thought, how utterly symbolic that actually is. Like, the, absolutely the right thing. We, what we will give you as a form of reparations is a prison. Yep. And that was the end of Portia. Yep. Uh, she was replaced yep, that's right. following yep. that. Yep. Because yep. that was insulting. Okay. Thanks, folks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.